Falchagu Yeo Scott's The Celtic Podcast. Kimra Ha Holodunya, how is everyone? On today's show in Fekimich Beck and Gallic, that's Let's Try Little Gallic. Lesson 10, Telling Time. Celtic History, The Second Invasion of Ireland, The Parthenonians. In Everyday Celtic Ways, St. Andrew and His Upcoming Day. Now we're going to hear music from Claire, uh, La Serena, Nicola, uh, Dougie McLean, Karina Hewitt, and Chris Andarucci. And as always, it's a wee bit of Irish trivia to start us off. So, which Irish sport gets mixed up at times with the Scottish game Shinty? All right, give me your answer. Check out the Yield Scott Facebook group where you can be a part of the Celtic culture. And keep an eye out for all the different videos our YouTube channel and Facebook group have to offer. Kershmaha, let's kick this thing off. Welcome to Learn a Gaelic Song. Today's song is Clovic Ila Michael. And it means the cloth of Carmichael. Now Carmichael was the name of a Scottish village in Lanarkshire, southwest of Glasgow. This, was, this is also the name of a sept of the clan Stuart of Apen, which is from the northeast of Oban, whose Gallic equivalent is Machila Vikil, or son of the servant of St. Michael. Now, historians assume that Alexander MacDonald availed himself of a pre existing tune entitled Carmichael's Cloth. However, the lyrics speak in a semi secretive tone about walking, but on a further inspection you can see the calling of the faithful clans for the Battle of Culloden. The not-so-hidden meaning is revealed in the last sentence, Do the hand walking with venom, and bloody the son of a whore. Alright, remember, Gallic at the top, English at the bottom. Get ready. <laughs>
Scottish Gaelic is native to the Gales of Scotland. Scottish Gaelic developed out of the Old Irish, and learning this beautiful language can be a direct link to your Gaelic ancestors. Follow along in Fekimich Beckham Gaelic, and like I said, let's try a little Gaelic. Falchagu ye old Scots, the beginner's Gaelic course. Kimraha Huladunya, how is everyone? Looky there, you already know how to say welcome to and how is everyone. Alright, in the next 25 lessons um, of Fekimich Beckham Gaelic, that's Let's Try a Little Gaelic, um, with a little work you can gain a rudimentary understanding of the Scottish Gaelic language. Now, these lessons were taken from my weekly podcast beginning back on May 15th of 2020. So if you like, you can listen to them or there as well. But please remember that I am not an authority on the Gaelic language. I just love learning it. I struggle like most all learners. And so what I teach comes right from well-respected Gaelic teachers. I hope you find it interesting, informative, and fun. And as always, I display on the screen what I'm discussing so you can follow along. All right, Kersh Maha, which means, all right then, let's get started. We're at lesson 10, and of course, as always, I display on the screen what I am discussing. All right, start off, uh, vocabulary to help you in telling time, which isn't always done so precisely. Sometimes they're a little vague in Gaelic. All right, so we're going to give you the English and the Gaelic, and I'm just going to run through these real quick, and you can come back to these anytime and for reference. Time, which is Tim. Second is Jig. Minute is Minich. Hour is Urahitcha. I've also seen it as just Ur. Day is Laha. Week is Shakhtan. Weekend, Jerdig Shakhtan. Fortnight, Kola Jig. Month, Nias. Season, Wraith Year Blina as Blina Ur, Happy New Year. A decade is a Jekic and a century is a Lean. All right, let's move on to times of the day. And you'll see a picture on the screen. We're going to have day, which is La, morning, which is Matin. Afternoon or evening is Fesker. Night is Oichia. And of course, say you wanted to say in the night or in the morning, it's Ansavatin in the morning, Ansa Fesker in the afternoon or evening, and Ansa Oichia in the night. Now, to talk about sunrise or sunset, you would use Balin, uh, Balin La or Balin Oichia, which means the mouth of the day or mouth of the night, meaning the beginning of the day or night. Now another way to say the same thing is Irina Grian or Dolfoda Naglian, which means the sun rising or the sun going down. All right, let's go ahead and move on to times of the week. You have today, which is Anju, yesterday, and Jay, tomorrow, Amarak, and the day after tomorrow, Anrir. Now, telling time, um, sometimes it can be vague, or but other times it can be precise. So you've got, like, question J and Urahae. What time is it? You have Ur, which is means hour or it means one o'clock and of course you have Uren which is hours okay um, of course you also want to use the construction the um, ha a it is whatever ha a blank Uren it is whatever o'clock okay because these are masculine that's why I use the E, the A. All right. 
Now you're going to see a picture of the clock face up there on your screen. And we're going to run through these real quick. I'm going to tell you it, it is this or it is that. It is ha e ur. It is one o'clock. Ha e da ur. It is two o'clock. Ha e tri urin. It is three o'clock. Ha e keher urin. It is four o'clock. Ha e koik urin. It is five o'clock. Ha e shia urin. It is six o'clock. Ha e shak urin. It's seven o'clock. Ha e ach hak urin. It is eight o'clock. Ha e noi urin. It is nine o'clock. Ha e chek urin. It is ten o'clock. Then ha e un ur chek. It is eleven o'clock. And you also have ha e da ur yig. It is twelve o'clock. Although that tends to just be turned into um, ha e mi and la which is, it is midday. Or if it's midnight, ha i mi in ohia, it is midnight. Okay. Um, we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about a little bit of the incremental parts of telling time. Like, you know, half past six. The word for half is le. Le ur is half an hour. Le ur and j is half past. Ha e le ur and j shak urin, or let's say half past seven o'clock. Ha e le ur and j keher, it is half past four, and so on. Then, if you want to say it's quarter two, it's karshul gu, quarter two. Koik minich gu, five minutes to and so on all right so that's pretty much it for telling time um, you can play around with it make some sentences and of course as always I've got six of them here for you to translate let's start off with number one J and U or ha a two ha a le ur and J ur three kunya ha u adol yaki Four, Aktri Urin. Five, Avelu Adol Yaki, Aktri Urin. Six, Hami Adol Lamok, Ak, and J. Kaker. Thank you. 
History brings you the tales of the land, castles, warriors, heroes, legends, and customs that have created the rich, vibrant, and sometimes strange and wonderful history of the Celtic world. This is an eight-part series on the Book of Invasions, Labar Gabala Eran, or the Book of Invasions of Ireland. The people of Ireland in medieval times had never believed that the Celtic-speaking people were native to their land. They had believed that the Ireland was invaded and settled by successive Celtic tribes over different periods. Their history is based largely upon the pseudo-historical Labar Gabala, translated into English as the Book of Invasions. Now, The Book of Invasions formed the major part of the Irish mythological cycle and was supposed to contain the history of Ireland. The cycle was written in the book titled Lavar Gavala. It is the stories of successive invasions and settlement of the Celtic peoples of Ireland. Now, there have been six invasions. Another main source of information, though, comes from the first and second Cath Turin, or the Battles of Mag Turin, which were mainly centered on the Tuath Danannan. The main interests come from the race of Irish deities known as Tuath Danannan. And they were supplanted by the Milesians, the last group of invaders, who became the ancestors of the modern Irish people. The Second Invasion Parthalanians The Parthalanians were the second group of Celtic people who settled in Ireland, but they were the first to arrive after the biblical flood. Not much was written about these people. Parthalonians were said to have come to from the west, from the land of the dead. The Parthalonians arrived 312 years after Caesar and her followers. The Parthalanians were named after their leader, Parthalon, son of Sarah, son of Sru, who was the king of Greece. Parthalon fled from Greece after murdering his own father and mother. Parthalon had lost his left eye when he attacked his parents, accompanied with his wife, Daniel and a group of followers, they reached Ireland after w wandering for seven years. They have encountered the Fomorians in their third year in Ireland, where they fought a battle in Slemna of Mach Etha. The Fomorians here were described as each had only a single arm and a single leg. The Parthalonians managed to defeat uh, Shickle, leader of the Fomorians, and drive the Fomorians from Ireland. However, Parthalon died. After 30 years living in Ireland, the rest of the Parthalanians died 120 years after from pestilence. 
The only survivor of the plague was Tuan, a nephew of Pathan. Now, this Tuan was the son of Starn and grandson of Sarah. Tuan witnessed the arrival of Nemet and his followers, known as the Nemedians, which is actually the third invasion. Tuan kept himself hidden from Nemedians. When Nemedians were gone from Ireland, Tuan still lived for many generations. Tuan survived because he was transformed into various animal shapes. First a stag, then a boar, and later as an eagle. In each form he witnessed successive early invaders of Ireland. When he was transformed into a salmon, he was caught one day and eaten by the wife of Caril, who immediately fell pregnant as a result of her meal. She gave birth to a son who was named Tuan Mephril. It was this reborn Tuan who was said to have written the book, The Labar Gabala. Now I mentioned the Fomorians. They were possibly nothing more than pirates or raiders since they never really settled in Ireland and never considered to be a Celtic people or Irish. The Fomorians were a race of strange beings. The Fomorians were ugly, misshapen giants who lived on Tory Island. They were cruel and violent and oppressive. The Fomorians had fought the Parthenonians, the Midians, and Tuath Dananans. For a while, the Fomorians ruled over all three of those groups, exacting tributes and taxes from them. These two groups suffered from the oppression and tyranny of the Fomorians. Later, Lu Lamfada led the Danan to overthrow the Fomorian oppression. The Tuath Dananan finally annihilated the Fomorians. Baylor was their leader, their last leader. Lu would later kill Baylor, the hero's grandfather. Truth be one I he kind of you name t- 
Everyday Celtic Ways brings you the mythology, traditions, and customs that have created a unique and personal culture that still affects those that are Celtic and those that just love the Celtic world. St. Andrew's Day is coming up on November 30th, and it's more than just another event to don your kilt and eat some haggis. St. Andrew holds a special place in the heart of Scotland, and for very good reason. The patron saint was born in Bethsaida in Galilee, which is, of course, now Israel. Andrew's home, though, was Copernicum. And like his brother Simon Peter, he was a fisherman. Yes, this is the Andrew of biblical times. Andrew, along with Peter, James, and John, formed the inner circle of Jesus' twelve apostles. Andrew was, however, a disciple of St. John the Baptist prior to becoming a follower of Christ. He was baptized by John the Baptist and was the first disciple of Jesus. In Greek Orthodox tradition, he is known as Protokletos, literally meaning the first called. Now, not a great deal is known about his early life other than he is mentioned in the Bible as taking part in the feeding of the 5,000. This is not absolutely certain where he preached the gospel or where he is even buried, but uh, Petrus in Achaia claims to be the place where he was martyred and crucified on the cross. But not just any cross, a cross turned on its side to form an X, because he did not feel he was worthy to be crucified like Jesus. This is why the Scottish flag displays a blue background on a white sideways cross or X. It's called a saltire. The flag honors the patron saint of Scotland, St. Andrew, despite Scotland not even being a country in Andrew's time. It was a wild land, on the edge of the known world, full of Celtic tribes. He will be remembered down through the ages for the way he met his terrible death on the 30th of November, uh, 60 AD. Now, that was done by the order of Roman governor Aegeus, when he was tied to an X-shaped cross in Greece, and 
Of course, you know, this is representative of the Scottish flag, the saltire, um, since at least 1385. St. Andrew's cross became his symbol, his cross, in white and on a blue background remains the proud symbol of Scotland. His remains were moved 300 years after his death to Constantinople, but by now Istanbul, by the Emperor Constantine. Whilst it is not certain where Andrew actually preached, Scythia, Trace, and Asia Minor have all been mentioned. It appears he traveled great distances in order to spread the word, and this may be what links him with Scotland. You see, St. Andrew is not just the patron saint of Scotland. He is the patron saint of Greece, Russia, Italy's Amalfi and Barbados, as well as other countries. He's the patron saint of singers, spinsters, maidens, fishmongers, fishermen, women wanting to be mothers, gout, and sore throats. St. Andrew is also the patron saint of the Order of Thistle, one of the highest ranks of chivalry in the world, second only to the Order of the Garter. But what ties St. Andrew to Scotland, you ask? Well, there's two versions of the events that claim St. Andrew's link to Scotland and its flag. Now, one legend builds upon Andrew's extensive travels, claiming that he actually came to Scotland and built a church in Fife. This town is now called St. Andrew's, and the church became a center for evangelism, and pilgrims came from all over Britain to pray there. Another ancient legend recalls how it was after the death of Andrew sometime in the 4th century that several of his relics were brought to Fife by rule. The purported relics of St. Andrew included a tooth, kneecap, arm, and finger bone. Now this meant the town of St. Andrew became a very popular medieval pilgrimage site up until the 16th century when they were destroyed in the Scottish Reformation in 1870. The Archbishop of Amalfi sent an apparent piece of St. Andrew's shoulder blade to Scotland, where it has been stored ever since in St. Mary's Cathedral in Edinburgh. Now, regardless of which story is true, the anniversary of his martyrdom is the 30th of November, and it is a date that is honored as his feast day each year. Churches were dedicated to him from early times throughout Italy and France, as well as in Anglo-Saxon England, where Hexham and Rochester were the earliest of the 637 medieval dedications. Nationalism is rampant in Scotland and has been for a very long time. St. Andrew, with his connection to our Lord Jesus Christ, is a large feather in the cap of Scotland. Now, it is also something to fight for and has been many times. It's also, sadly, something to die for and has been done many times before. This is why we celebrate the patron St. Andrew. He is a symbol that resembles the land he represents so well. Honorable, humble, hardworking, reverent, and of course, tough. So, so go ahead and get on your kilt, eat your little haggis, but remember, the day is about St. Andrew. Their silks and knaves, their wine, 
Now remember to check out my YouTube channel. It's got Celtic music, podcasts, Gaelic language, Gaelic song, Celtic history videos, plus lots more. And my Facebook group where you can give me your inputs and insights on all things Celtic. But before I let you go, the trivia question answer. The Irish sport that gets mixed up at times with Scottish game is shinty. Well, that's hurling. Martian leaving Drosden. Bye for now. And I'm going to let you go with a song.
see the changes that have come over me in these last few days I've been afraid that I might drift away so I've been telling old stories singing songs that make me think about where came from and well that's the reason why I seem so far away today so let me tell you that I love you and I'll think about you all the time a Caledonia you calling me now I'm going home But if I should become a stranger You know that it would make me more than sad A Caledonia's been everything I've ever had Moved, and I've kept on moving Proved the points that I needed proving And well I lost the friends That I needed losing And found others on the way And I have tried And I've kept on trying Stolen dreams, yes, there's no denying And well, that's the reason Why I seem so far away today So let me tell you that I love you And I'll think about you all the time Caledonia, you're calling me Now I'm going on But if I should become a stranger You know that it would make me more than sad A Caledonia's been everything I've ever had Tell you that I love you And I'll think about you all the time A Caledonia, you're calling me Now I'm going home But if I should become a stranger You know that it would make me more than sad Caledonia's been everything I've ever had Caledonia's been everything I've ever had